What if getting your water wasn't as simple as this? This doesn't seem like something you could pick up at a Home Depot and then do it do yourself, could you? No, but it, it actually is. You don't want to carry it from Lake Mead, and you certainly don't want to be responsible for treating it. All that water's recycled, by the way. Not everybody does what we're doing. No, yeah. uh, this is actually very unique. On the shores of Lake Mead is the Alfred Merritt Smith Water Treatment Facility, the biggest in southern Nevada, treating up to 600 million gallons of water each day. And we want to show you this process that you probably don't want to do on your own. Making sure your water is safe to drink is not something you want to worry about every day or especially plan for the future and make sure that in spite of something that we don't know that could be coming down the line, that your water is safe to drink. And Hannah Ray is here. This is your job, research engineer for the Water District and the Water Authority. Hannah, why, where are we and, and what is this room? Why are we here? Where we are is what we call the pilot plant, but in essence, it's our mini drinking water treatment plant. So every single treatment process that we do at full scale, we have a smaller version here that we're able to test different conditions and look to the future about what changes we might need to make. And we're gonna take you through the process so you learn a little bit more about that, but especially about the research that Hannah and her team does, again, to ensure future safety of drinking water in case there's an event that we didn't plan for that might take place with our water supply. So where's our first stop? First stop right here is the raw water skid. So each treatment process we call a skid right here. So this is where we have our raw water coming from Lake Mead, just as we do at full scale. We can add chemicals like we do at full scale for something like coaga mussels or chemicals we'd add before our ozonation. So what are some of the typical chemicals that you would add to start the process? You would add ammonia as well as bleach. And so that would be something that you would help with our ozone process, but also it helps remove the coaga muscles at the intake so that it doesn't clog up the intake. Okay, so people hear ammonia and bleach and naturally freak out, but right, yeah. these are small levels and it's all under federal safe drinking water yes. standards. Okay, so after the raw water, what's the next step? The next step is gonna be ozonation. So this is really our first treatment process at full scale. So what we're doing here, as you can see, we're bubbling in gaseous ozone. And as it bubbles, the bubbles pop, the ozone dissolves in solution, and then we have our water and our ozone in contact. And it serpentines through these contactors. And as ozone is in contact with our water, it kills bacteria, it breaks down compounds, and it's very quick to dissipate. So by the end of the treatment process, the ozone is gone. And if not, we do add a chemical to remove it. Because we want all of the ozone treatment to happen just during our treatment process. Ozonation kills the bacteria. Now we're on to flocculation, which it sounds like a swear word to me, but what is flocculation? <laughs> so this treatment process is called coagulation flocculation. And what we do here is we need to remove particles. So if we have any dirt or things that are floating in our water that we want to remove, we use a coagulant. So that's really just a sticky compound. You just put it in the water. It causes all the other dirt and stuff to stick to it. And you create these really big particles called flocks, which are much easier to remove in the next treatment process. So we're killing the bacteria first, then we're getting the larger particles together, mm -hmm. and then the next process, we get rid of it. Exactly. Hannah, correct me if I'm wrong, this doesn't seem like something you could pick up at a Home Depot and then do it do yourself, could you? No, but it actually is a pretty easy process for us because of the fact that the water coming in from Lake Mead is very low particles. So we don't have to add a lot of coagulant. We don't have to remove a lot of particles because they're not there. So our water is already pretty clean as is, but any residual particles we want to get out, we can. So low particles, but mineral rich, and that's what contributes to our taste. But what if, here's the teaser, what if there might be a storm event that blows a lot of debris into Lake Mead or the Lake Mead water levels go down to the point where the water isn't as cool or as clean, where we can take it right now from deeper depths because the, the lake levels are a little bit higher. So, we're gonna talk about that, yes? We are, because yeah, that is something you have to plan for.
So the last step in the treatment process in our mini plant and our big plants is filtration. Again, small scale here, we do it on a much bigger scale here at AMS, but what are we looking at? So this is our filters here, and this is where we're gonna remove all those particles, those big fat particles we created, the flocks in coagulation flocculation. So you pass the water through, those flocks get stuck in the media, and then coming out is your particle-free, clean water. And so actually the filter media that we have here is the exact same filter media that we use at full scale. It's gonna be anthracite for the majority, which is just a carbon-based compound. And then we have sand at the bottom. And this depth is actually the exact same depth that we use at full scale, because we wanna be as exact as possible when simulating full scale scenarios. Hannah, it looks like a big Brita filter. Is that what this is? Uh, essentially, it is very comparable to a Brita filter. Okay, well, I want to talk to the folks at home for a minute. This is going to be a special moment for you all if you use filtration devices or anything like a Brita pitcher. Hannah, we clean our filters. Some of the people at home, it might be years since they've cleaned their filters, yes? Yes, and then you can get a biofilm and that makes your water taste bad. But our filters here, we have to clean every couple days where we do something called a backwash, where we have too many particles in here, so then we have to push water backwards to dislodge all of the particles we've removed. That dirty water then gets sent to the front of the plant where we'll then treat it again. Um, so then these can be put back in line as clean filters. Okay, so we're showing you the backwash right now. It looks pretty disgusting. Yeah. Is this potentially what people have in their home filters and they have no idea? Uh, to an extent, yeah. This is what, as long as you have particles coming in and you have a filter there, you're going to be removing them and they're going to just compile and you're going to have more and more particles. So unless you're cleaning it out or changing out your filter, it's not going to do much at some point. So you all got smarter today by learning more about our treatment process, but Hannah, now let's talk about really the utility for this room, which is planning for future events, making sure our treatment process is state of the art and that we're ready if something unexpected comes. And these are things like major storm events that bring a lot of particles into our raw water at Lake Mead, algae blooms, which have occurred in the past, and also climate change, the temperature at Lake Mead rising. That means we've got to change our process, yes? It does, yeah. So. An increase in the temperature as the lake levels drop is expected, and that will affect all of the treatment processes, but really one in particular is ozonation. So ozonation is very uh, sensitive to an increase in temperature. So we need to test what do we need to do? What do we need to alter at our full-scale treatment plant if we do see a rise in temperature? And so we're able to do that with our pilot. So we actually have here, these are heaters. So we're able to heat up the, the water that's coming into our ozone pilot, and we're able to look at different temperature points. And then we're able to look at what we need to do to change so we meet our treatment goals. So whether that's add more ozone at a higher concentration. Maybe it's increase the contact time for how long the ozone is in contact with the water. But we're able to figure out what we need to do at full scale so that we're always meeting our treatment goals. I'm putting you on the spot here. Not everybody does what we're doing. No, yeah. uh, this is actually very unique. Most water treatment plants don't even have a research and development team, let alone have something like this where they have a full treatment process that they can test and change conditions for to help prepare for the future. It's very unique. Yeah, I really hope that you're understanding how Las Vegas and Southern Nevada really does set the standard for conservation and research and development. We do it here, and that's why you have one of the safest water supplies, not only in the country, but in the world. Storm events are, are pretty common out here, right? We get high winds, we get monsoons, but we're talking about like major, major, if there is a major storm event that affects our water supply, we've gotta be ready for that? Yes, yeah, so we could call it a particle event where we see a large storm that pulls in a lot of particles, a lot of sediment in from the Colorado River, from Lake Mead, and then we start to see an influx of particles coming into the treatment plant. So as of right now, we don't have a lot of particles. It's very easy to remove what is in our water right now. But if we have a lot more coming in a high influx, that's going to change what we have to do in terms of how much coagulant, that sticky count. Wait, chemical. wait, wait, hold on. Our flocculators okay. need to flocculate better. Yes, yes they do. We need, <laughs> we're going to need to produce even more flocks because we're going to have to remove so many more particles. So we might need to change the dose of that. So how much more chemical? 
Is there another chemical we could add that could even optimize the process even better? So those are the things that we can do, and we've actually done that. We've gone and collected sediment from Lake Mead. We've dosed in high amounts of sediment to see what we need to do to change for our full scale if we have an event like this. We test your drinking water over 300,000 times annually looking for all sorts of contaminants. And one of those contaminants that we're prepared to deal with if it does happen is algae. We had an event over two decades ago, but unlikely to happen, right? But we have to be prepared for it, yes? Yes, as we pull from the bottom of the lake right now, an algae event is not expected to affect our treatment plant, but we wanna be prepared. If that ever happens, how are we gonna handle that? Because back in 2001, the algae really did affect our filters where you know we backwash, we clean those filters out about once every two days. We were down to every couple hours. So we wanna see how we can optimize this process so that we can extend the runtime of these filters and not have to backwash so often. So we can simulate algae events on this pilot. We can also even do batch testing, even on a smaller scale, where we look at different types of algae, some that are very harmful. How can we remove those with coagulation, with inflocculation, or filters? Or even look at something more innovative and look at something called DAF which is dissolved air flotation, which is a new technology that we're looking at implementing during these events to help better remove algae so we don't have issues with our filters. Okay, so here's the deal. You heard a lot in this video. You heard a lot about things that are over my head. They might be over your head, but the point of this whole thing here, Hannah, and thank you so much for taking us through the pilot plant here at Alfred Merritt Smith, is that you don't have to worry about it. Hannah and our team of hundreds of researchers do this on the daily. So when you turn on that tap the next time, think about Hannah and think about all the great work that we do at the Southern Nevada Water Authority to ensure your water quality meets or exceeds federal drinking water standards. Thanks for watching this video. If you want to learn more about our water quality, just click the link on this next video right here.